get ready and go baby go hello my friends hello my life warriors wherever you are in the world welcome mm. to the day in day out podcast Woo! today on episode oh, 315 i'm very lucky to have <clears throat> renu uh reno huh? reno reno go for it ah you see yeah. i look i knew up like this is the thing when I when when I saw your name, I knew this was going to be the minefield of late names for me. I was like, going, okay, I practice in the mirror. I practice again, and yes, I'm sorry, I've messed it up. But it's okay. You know, when I when I was in grade school, you know, in the first day of class, they'd be calling down the roster. They'd get to the P's, and I'd see the teacher staring, and I'd say, "I'm here." Yes, yes, it's me. It's me. <laughs> yeah. Now I have to that uh, you have been a therapist and a teacher for the last two decades, and you've written a number of books. Uh, yeah. Yes. How, how did you like? How did you find your way into the realm of therapy, or and teaching in the beginning? Well, I was always interested in animal behavior as a kid. My parents came from farming backgrounds, so we had chickens and dogs, and you know rabbits and different things we raised and you know we we train them you know i'd have the chickens they could stand on little boxes and stuff for me uh you don't of course that's just the layers you don't do that with the fryers right because they, they're, they're just there for six weeks so uh <laughs> so i always had an interest in uh animal behavior uh and uh i was interested in biology so my original degree was uh, biology and so i specialized in theology which is animal behavior and Back then, uh, imprinting, a lot of that stuff was being identified. And then I had a friend of mine that was a therapist and decided I wanted to work with people. And so I just, I shifted from animals to human behavior, you know, which sometimes I say was a step down, you know, because animals are so much easier. Uh, <laughs> they're easier to understand. Anyway, and so I, I got involved with, uh, well, th this was after teaching for a few years. I decided to switch into uh, working with people uh, and, and a therapeutic. And so I worked with anxiety disorders. Uh, as a budding therapist, I was looking around for something to specialize in. Did not want to do substance abuse because I like to win. And uh, substance abuse, you know, you get a lot of relapse, a lot of, you know, it's a, it's a much more long-term difficult thing. So uh, I found uh, anxiety disorders was great because people get better. And uh, I found that a lot of the personality stuff was similar to mine. So, you know, it worked worked great. Did that for 20 years and then uh, switched over to teaching in a local college and did that for quite a while. Ah, I see. Uh, I wonder, like, this is the thing. One of the things I wonder about, like, okay, 20 years ago to today, mm -hmm. now, anxiety disorders, like, has it got worse over the course of time? you found like over those 20 years or is it a case of we're just talking about it more? well anxiety has been around since adam and eve so uh <laughs> yeah. there have been you know because it's just all about threat right uh, i think one of the problems uh, today is well we do identify it better when i first started uh, I worked a lot with something called panic disorder, and most of the people I worked with had been experiencing it for 15, 20 years. And by the time I left private practice, I was getting people where it had been identified, you know, three, four months ahead of time, which was great because then it was a much easier, you know, solution to to get them back on track again. Mm -hmm. um, so certainly identification is um, better. Uh I think in our modern age, especially with some of the younger generation, uh, they don't have uh, the tools to cope with life as, as well as some of the people uh, in the past. It, it used to be when you raised your kids, everything in society basically helped to reaffirm those skills they, that they needed to be a productive and happy adult. Mm -hmm. You know, TV programs, all you know, music, all that stuff kind of reinforced the values of culture. And nowadays, it's like everything is opposite, right? Uh, and raising kids nowadays is very difficult. Uh, a lot more stuff going on. You know, they, they get exposed to stuff at younger ages that probably is not healthy for them to be exposed to. Uh, families have been disintegrated. You know, the, the most successful way to have a happy kid is to have two parents who love each other, right? And we don't see a lot of that anymore. Uh, I mean, it's out there, but... Uh, 
you got a lot of single parent families that are struggling uh just a lot of social things going on a lot of the stuff that did not used to go on i mean the worst thing we had when i was a kid was the atom bomb you know cold war and all of that stuff you know which was you know uh anxiety producing but you know most of us just said well if it happens it happens you know and we got out with our life uh so so there's a lot of factors there's not a single factor but but i do think there's a lot more anxiety depression that certainly has been measured a lot more if you get into the things that make people happy uh which i talk about in in the book um it's, it's easy to see because number one thing that makes people happy is relationship having deep meaningful relationships People don't have that nowadays, especially, you know, the saddest thing for me is to go out to a restaurant and see both parents on their phones and the kid on their device, right? And nobody's talking to each other. Uh, you have, especially since COVID, you know, so many people are isolated. They get all their uh, connection through the internet. And a lot of times it's a very superficial connection. Uh, there's something called fear of missing out that a lot of people experience because they see home. these wonderful images of everybody having a better life than me right <laughs> and of course it's all a lie because nobody posts the, the negative side of their life on the internet besides most people don't uh, and uh, i know when i was uh, in at this college it was a business college and we even had to towards the end of it end of it teach uh, a lot of the students how to like go to a luncheon with a boss or how to have an interview, you know, things like you don't have your phone on the table when you're doing an interview, just simple things that, you know, most people would say is obvious, but it's amazing how much of the younger generation has, has missed a lot of that. Um, and uh, so, yeah, there's a lot more when you, when you look at that, you look at the second thing, which is purpose, having a purpose in life. And the third one is meaning, you know, where do you get my meaning for? Um, and those are things that are in very short supply. And so there's no wonder that there's a lot more, you know, anxiety, depression, and that type of stuff going on. People are really struggling trying to figure out, you know, you know, why am I here? What's my purpose? You know, what am I supposed to do? So th those types of questions. Yeah. I, I would say, I think it sometimes stems from a realm of the, like a number of young people, they are doing stuff. And they are quote unquote working on stuff, but they're not working on actually anything for, on them like themselves. Really, it is quite a lot of superficial things where mm -hmm. like, trying to find meaning, purpose, and like yeah, to build those sort of bonds of friendship. It, because they haven't worked on themselves, they don't actually know what true values they have for themselves. Rather than sort of jumping on whatever trendy meme or like whatever trendy thing is at that precise moment in time. Um, well, and, and people are very busy right now. You know, there, there's uh, everybody is walking around on an overload of information an overload of uh, input. I mean, the big thing right now is entertainment, right? I need to be entertained all the time. So I got to <laughs> have my, you know, my music going. I got to have, you know, the computer stuff going on. Uh, used to be people spend a lot more time having quiet I mean, even when I grew up, you know, uh, which was back when the dinosaurs roamed the earth. But uh, <laughs> oh, come on now, don't be so me. No, no, no. I will not have this on this podcast. Like, but, 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 you know, there, there was there was more time to be by yourself and be quiet and to be reflective. And you know, everybody's busy, 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 busy now. I know with my my kids, uh, and and that was actually just the just before the internet age. Uh, just to turn the radio off, you know, and just, and while we were driving in the car and doing stuff like that, uh, just so we would have some quiet time and time to talk and things, you know, sometimes that even was difficult for them. Of course, part of that's just adolescence, right? But, uh, uh, people don't take time to just be quiet, which is, I think why the mindfulness movement is so popular among a lot of people, just that idea of taking time to be quiet and mindful of, you know, what's going on inside of, of yourself. Uh -huh. Yeah, gotta, gotta have gotta have that input. Always gotta have input, right? <laughs> well, like, this is the thing. Uh, yeah, I do agree that there is a. It's it's not so much busier. It's just it's all, like all of this trying to grab your attention and just basically just keep you distracted one like every minute. Like because um back like back when mobile phones were really becoming smartphones, 
the game, like the king of games back then, was Angry Birds. When you play, yeah. when you queued up, when you like, do, like always filling that little micro like space of time where you may have like stood in the queue, maybe turned, had a conversation, or you yeah. know, just be lost in your thoughts. Uh, and it actually changes how your brain's ability to focus and stuff. I know I've seen a couple of studies where they say when you spend a lot of time surfing, your brain gets so used to looking for hyperlinks that to sit down and read a book in depth, you, it takes you actually some, uh, you know, some time for your brain to shift gears to be able to start absorbing on a more detailed level what, what you're reading. So uh, those types of habits, I think, I, I know even when I was teaching that they talk about how you have to shift activities at least every 15 minutes, otherwise you're going to lose your students. So you had to, you know, don't, don't spend more than 15 minutes on something and then you either do an activity or you do something different so that you can shift attention because every your students are so used to that constant shift uh, from one thing to another that if you try to stay with one thing too long, it was difficult. And I saw that with a lot of my students. Uh, yeah, I would say with regards to, like, if I take this sort of analogy of a sprinter and a marathon runner, mm-hmm. like, at, our attention spans have now been sort of focused in on sprinting every moment. Yeah, um, yeah. Getting that long distance, um, like, yeah, putting that endurance in. Yeah, uh, it's, I would say a lo- number of people have lost it. Uh, not even just young kids, I would say adults as well. As well, yeah. On by. It, it's, it's where you're putting your head all the time, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, so. yeah. If you don't have that little black rectangle, like just, uh, like just out of arm's reach. <laughs> yeah, I know. Uh, so with, like, with all of this, and, like the distractions, the attention, like grabbing, like, what would you like? See someone come came to you and went, yeah, I have anxiety. I don't know what to do. Everything like this. What would you like? I know this is very general, but is there sort of like one or key, one or two sort of key steps for people? They would like you say maybe you should do X, maybe you should do Y, when you are. Well, and, and it depends upon you know because there's a lot of different different reasons why people get anxious. But, but one study I saw, they had uh, people just uh, reduce the amount of time they spent online. I think it was like an hour a week or something like or an hour a day. And they did that for, you know, a couple of weeks. And they found that on all their measures of happiness, they were doing better. So one of the things I would suggest people is, is to, you know, reduce the amount of time you're spending on social media and surfing. It doesn't mean you have to abandon it. Just you have to gain control over it. I know uh, even back when I first started, one of the things I, I would tell my clients is quit watching evening news. Um, you know, nowadays I, you know, I say, you know, go to a news aggregate site, one that you like, you know, spend 15 minutes, you know, maybe half hour, get your news in. And then, but, but like television news, it's all geared towards making you anxious, right? Because it's, that's how they sell. <laughs> it's the old thing. If it bleeds, if it bleeds, it leads, right? So yeah. if it's, so the, and, and you don't get the full story. So you can go on, go to a news aggregate site and you can, you know, click on your, your stories that you're, you know, catch your eye and you can read and get a lot more in 15, 20 minutes than you can watch in, you know, the evening news. So that's one of the things that, that I used to recommend people do. And, and that in itself would help a lot of people. Uh, and anxiety is a message. Uh, all emotions are messages about some need that's either being taken care of or not being taken care of. And so a lot of times anxiety is just a message that you're, there's some area of your life you're not dealing with, you're not taking care of uh, in, in, a, in a healthy way. Um, a lot of times uh, I, I dealt a lot with panic attacks, people that had panic attacks and they would get, we'd get to the point where they weren't having panic attacks anymore and they were just experiencing what we would call normal anxiety because we you know you get anxious during the day for this or that reason whatever and they might come back after six months and say you know i had a panic attack the other day what's that about and i said okay let's go through the checklist okay how are your relationships doing you know primary relationships how's kids doing how are your friendships doing how's work going how about your life goals and at some point in there they would say well you know this happened but it wasn't that big a deal <laughs> 
well, okay. The panic attack tells me it was a big deal. So <laughs> you need to deal with it, right? You need to address it. A, a lot of what I found, because the people I worked with had reactive bodies and they were just, you know, sensitive people, which is actually was a good quality because it's the thing that other people like best about them. But it also meant that they were kind of like a house where the wiring's not up to, not up to code. And so you plug too many things in the circuit breaker strip, right? Yes. So for them, actually, it was a benefit because it forced them to keep what I call short accounts. When things came up in their lives, they needed to address it in a realistic way. Otherwise, they're going to start to experience this anxiety. And a lot of times that's what's going on with people is they're not addressing relationship needs. They're not addressing uh, life goal needs. Um, there's something else that in their life that they're ignoring because they're busy just being entertained on a superficial level. And they're not dealing with some of that deeper stuff that they need to be dealing with. Mm. Interesting. Interesting. Now, with regards to, like, you mentioned, like, yeah, dealing with friendships and stuff like this. And one of mm. the like, main things, I would say, a, a number of, like, yeah, you could say, guys out there, like, oh, yes, they feel anxiety because if they went, okay. How many, how many friends do you have? Do I have personally? No, I mean, uh, a person. Well, you know, if you, if you have two or three people in your life, and that could either be a significant other or it could be very close friends, if you've got two or three people in your life that you can be really transparent with, you can go and you can talk about things that, you know, that you're upset about, or things that you're happy about. Uh, you really don't need a therapist for the most part, most of the time. Yeah. Because <laughs> a, a lot of times I was just a paid friend, you know because they had nobody else that they could really be transparent with. And it used to be, we had lots of people around us that we could go talk to. You know, uh, we used to, you know, you go back to the small village or you go back to the block or you go back to your neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And again, because we're so mobile and we're so fragmented as a society nowadays, we don't have that person down the block or that person upstairs or that person next door or uncle Joe or whoever, uh, that we can sit down and talk to about maybe, you know, this came up in my life and I, I just wanted to bounce this off for you. And so th I think if you have those types of people in your life, then usually you do a lot better. Uh, I mean, people live so isolated oftentimes and they don't, and they're just communicating again on that superficial level that they're not, not uh, connecting at a deep level, which is again, why relationships is one of the, one of the key things for happiness. I mean, you go to uh, developing countries where people don't have a lot of stuff and yet they're very rich in relationships. And even though sometimes they have very hard lives, uh, they're much more at peace uh, and happy than people in our industrialized countries. Yeah. Because like the whole thing is, um, there was this, uh, there was this guy who like was going to get married to like, get married. Mm -hmm. And like his lady went, Who's your like? Who's going to be your best man? And he sat down, and he's, like, tried to think about it, and he was like, still thinking about it. And like, after like a couple of days, he was like, going, "Yeah, there is no one." And I yeah. think that's a case of like, with like guys, they they fall into that trap where they don't have anyone, as you as you eloquently put it, and yeah, being there to be like just down the road or in their like workplace or right. hang out to have these connections to sort of build on that happiness. Um, I, it's easy to say, go out there and make a friend. But... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Go, go, go run a friend somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> when you look at, at our emotions, and again, this is something I talk about in the first part of the book, there's like seven emotional circuits uh, that we have that we share with all the other, you know, mammals, your pets and everything. And a lot of them have to do with connection. Um, I mean, there's uh, two types of fear circuits. Uh, one is danger, but the other one in infants, we call it separation anxiety. But it's why we miss people when we're, when they're gone. And there's a complementary caring circuit again. And that's, that's part of what binds us together as people. Uh, it's interesting. Another one that that's kind of fun is the play circuit. Uh, all mammals love to play, especially their infants. And the more social the, the animal, then the more that play becomes important, even as adults. I mean, that's why as adults, we like to play. And it's part of how we 
we learn limits and it's part of how we interact with people. And, and you have all these circuits inside of ourselves that are designed to connect us together. And when we don't have that connection, again, we suffer for it. And when you say play, is like people are like, oh, yes, you can, we play games online all the time. Or are you talking about, yes, being like on a team? Well, it, it, ta it, it, it takes different forms as we get older. I mean, I've got a three and a half year old uh, great granddaughter that, that I deal with. And her favorite thing is tickle me. <laughs> you know? She loves me tickled. In fact, the, the guy that's discovered the circuit, circuit, uh, he he was called the rat tickler because one of the first things he uh, identified is he could tickle rats, and if you if you slow down their vocalizations, it sounds like laughter. And <laughs> and uh, anyway, so that's he got he got famous being the rat tickler. But uh, but you look at monkeys, you look at puppies, wolves, you know, cats, kittens, you know, they they love to play. And again, it's part of how you know infants learn social limits. You know, it's when your your child goes too far, you say, okay, that's too far. And mm -hmm. as adults, part of that is, is our interaction as well. It's, it's We're designed where we want to have that that fun, what we enjoy it, unless it gets beat out of us. I mean, all these things can be beaten out of us as we depend upon our history and our you know development and stuff. Um, but it, it's one of the things that connects us. You know, one, one of the interesting circuits for me when I was doing this research is something called seeking. They call it a seeking circuit. And if you look at any infant, uh, they have this d drive to go out and explore their environment. They want to look at things and you know check things out. And it's why when you go to a new situation, like you're in the doctor's office or a stadium or something, the first thing you do is you look around and check everything out. And, and it's, it's an actual drive inside of us to want to just see what's out there and explore and identify those things that, you know, are there good things? Are there bad things? You know, is there danger or am I okay? You know, and it's, it's an actual, what they call an affect. In fact, uh, I think to understand it, um, maybe just mention briefly what an affect is. The neuroscience looks at affects in, in people, and the basic ones are your sensory affects, like uh, uh, pressure, heat, and cold. You know, if you're sitting too long, you want to move because of pressure, or if you're cold, you want to get warm. And the next level up are the, um, the sensory motor affects, uh, like hunger and thirst, you know, if I'm really thirsty, then I, the drive to find something to drink gets stronger and stronger, right? And so emotions are a type of affect that push you to take care of a need. And so there's that seeking need to just to be aware of what's going on in your environment. There's that play need. There's that separation anxiety, you know, when people are close to you. And then there's that caring circuit. In fact, if, if you're at like a fair or someplace and you see a little kid fall down, watch the other kids. And you can all see them suddenly become really concerned, right? And because that's that caring circuit kicking in. Um, and of course, there's the anger, lust. You know, when we're everybody knows about lust, right? When we hit puberty, <laughs> <laughs> and, and all those things again are part of what what makes us human beings. And they're all basic needs that need to be addressed, and hopefully in a, in, a, in a positive way. I mean, sometimes we learn how to deal with those things in very negative ways, but uh, we should, you know. Just have to look around the world and see that stuff going on. Yeah, that's way. Uh, yeah. yeah, no, it uh, the world feels like sometimes a, a bit of a deep place at this present time because, like, it seems like just observing, and this might just be down to, like, say, a YouTube feed I watch or anything like this. It just feels like there is a lot more sort of anxiety going around, and yeah, a lot more fracturing. Uh, with regards to society as a whole. Because a, a lot of the things that glued people together have are unraveling in a lot of ways. So, yeah. so you can find those things out there. There's, they still exist. It's just a lot of people don't even realize that that's something that they need to do because they're so caught up again in that, that busyness, um, you know, either work and then you get in, get your headset on, you know, you, you, you're, you know, it's, it's interesting with, you can leave the car, you, you leave your home, you know, you've got garage, garage door openers and things like that. You can spend your whole day and never have a meaningful contact with another person. Yeah. And a lot of people do that. And, yeah. and when you do that, these really core needs for connection are not being satisfied. And so then they manifest and either manifest in other ways 
either as anxiety or the need for uh, more uh, stimulation of some type to cover up that need. You know, it's kind of like an alcoholic, right? They're, they're basically, uh, you know, escaping. Uh, you know, they're using it to dead in pain or to, to escape things in their life a lot of times. And then, you know, it takes on a life of its own. But uh, we use our electronic media that way. In many ways, our society is like a little kid with our new toys, right? It's interesting because every brand new invention, it takes a, a couple of generations for society to kind of figure out how to work with it. You know, whether we're talking about, you know, fire or we're talking about, you know, moving into arrows or we're talking about uh, television or telephones, uh, you know, computers. We're just now actually starting to get a handle on some of what it, what it can do and how to use them wisely. And now we've got this whole new thing that started with, you know, the Internet. And how do we how do we manage that in a way that's going to be healthy for us as opposed to ODing on everything? No, that is the sixty four thousand dollar question, yeah. um, which I don't think uh, anyone has a very uh, clear or easy answer for at this present time. Well, uh, it, it, individuals do. It's a matter of taking time to decide. Okay, how much time am I going to devote to it? And Am I going to spend time cultivating those other areas of their of my life? You know, there, there's the old saying of, of sharpening the saw. You know, you have the, the story of, of the guy that's out there trying to cut down a tree and he's swearing he can't cut it down. And somebody walks by and says, what's the problem? My, my axe is dull, right? So, well, why don't, you, why don't you sharp? I don't have time. So it keeps chopping and chopping. So it's that idea you got to sharpen the, the saw or sharpen the axe, and then life goes easier. And we don't take time for that. And the sharpening of the axe has to do with taking time to be quiet, taking time to cultivate relationships, and spending time with people that are important and meaningful to you. And it's, it's a decision that you have to make, and you need to make it based on understanding that it's important. You're going to suffer if you don't do those things. Self-reflection and connection. Yeah. Uh, like, yeah. And like this is the thing. Um, <laughs> I would say both sometimes are in very sort of poor stead because I can connect to a million people. And oh, yeah. Line, but yeah, I, got, I, got, I got a couple of thousand friends on Facebook. <laughs> and, like, the whole thing is, yeah. <laughs> It's like, you know, you're like, oh, okay, until you say meet a couple of them face to face, like, That's shit right. and then all of a sudden it becomes a lot more firmer, it becomes more real, it, it has more value to it. They're not this sort of nameless number, they have a name, but they just this blur, so yeah. Well, it's 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 the illusion of friendship, you know. It's the illusion of having stuff, and yeah, just a lot, lot, lot. Our, it's because we, we think superficially about so much stuff in our culture right now. Yeah, I wonder how we can break the cycle. <laughs> I don't know. What do you? Well, think? I, I mean, there's a lot of people talking about this stuff. There's a lot of different. Uh, uh, people that are chipping away at it in different ways. I mean, a program like this, you know, the book I wrote, part of what it's about is to try to educate people as to, you know, what, what are your emotions and what are some of the things that you need and how, how do you deal with life? Uh, how do you uh, quiet some of those negative response patterns that you have? And how do you find uh, some of that fulfillment that, that you want, whether you realize it or not, um, again, we are so addicted to entertainment and stimulation, um, leastwise in, in, you know, the industrialized countries. Indeed, indeed. Uh, so we like, with regards to just being overly stimulating like this, like, what I, would you I, I'm, I miss that. I said with uh, being overly stimulated. Oh, yeah. Uh, in the developed world, let's say, like, what would you say to like some people to sort of help uh, build like a more a stronger mindset, a, like a more resilient mindset? Uh, well, well, I, I think um, exploring literature, whether it's my book or something like that, uh, to just to be, to become, to become more. Yeah, buy the book, right? <laughs> <laughs> 
uh, you know, just 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 taking some time to 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 look at what you're doing in your life, what's important to you, and in terms of you know your basic needs, uh, relationship, and other needs, uh, am I spending time dealing with it? Am I using entertainment as uh, just a constant fix, or am I using it wisely? I mean, I, I enjoy being on the internet and you know. It's, surfing around and looking at things and stuff. Um, but I also turn it off. <laughs> oh, I hear you. I hear you. Now, uh, now, what would you say, like, with that, like, how would you say you, um, like, that sort of leads into, does that sort of connect into how you can handle stress management too? Or is there like uh, something to do that? Well, you know, stress management is, is a whole nother topic area. I used to do a lot of stress management classes. You know, one of the, one of the, one of the maybe important things I, to talk about with stress is just to being aware of when you are stressed out. It's amazing how many people can be really stressed out and not really realize it until they're having major symptoms. I mean, a lot of my people that I worked with were that way. They were very out of touch with their body. And one of the things uh, I, I would encourage them to do is to come up with kind of an early warning system for stress. Uh, everybody has things that they do um, when they're stressed out that's unique. And so you just think about times when you've been really stressed out and what are some of those behaviors or activities that uh, are your stress indicators? Like for me, uh, there's a change in how I use language sometimes. And you have to understand my dad was a sailor, right? So, <laughs> uh, you know, 21 years of the Navy, right? So, uh, or if I start spending a lot of time just playing some stupid computer game, you know, uh, mindlessly, you know, a lot of times those are indicators that something's eating at me. So maybe I need to take a look at, okay, so what's been going on in my life? Um, you know, what's, what's been out of ordinary lately? And, and then, okay, then that's, that's something that I need to maybe address. Uh, real simple example. Um, I've got a real good friend of mine uh, moves away. So I'm moping around, you know, I'm crabbing at the wife, you know, I'm wasting time on the computer. And of course, your spouse is usually very good at pointing these things out, right? So, uh, so I noticed, okay, I something's know. going on. So let me take a look at what's happening. Okay, family's okay, kids are okay, job's okay. Let's see, friendships. My best friend just moved away. Oh, maybe I'm lonely. Okay, what do I need to do about that? Well, I can connect with him, you know, over the internet or something. I can maybe start to develop a new friendship. Uh, but that's a need in my life that I need to address. So. Those early warning indicators that something's bugging you, I think we need to pay attention to. And that's something that people don't do a lot. And I think that's one of the one of the most important things for stress management is just being aware of when it's affecting you and understanding that it's just a message that there's something you need to deal with. And the stress may be because you've got some some big thing coming up and you're not dealing with that, what we call the negative anticipation, the what if thinking. So maybe you need to deal with that more effectively. I know a lot of my clients uh, really got into the what if stuff, you know, what if this happens? What if that happens? You know, and they would do two things that we call emotional reasoning, right? I'd say, okay, for, for example, a lot of my panic disorder people, they, they were afraid that because they would hyperventilate and they were afraid they would, they would pass out when they go out and do something. Right. So I'd say, so, so what are the odds that you're going to pass out when you go to the grocery store? Oh, I don't know, maybe 70%. Okay, so how many times have you passed out? Well, I've never passed out. So based on experience, it was very low, but based on their, you know, their, their emotional reasoning, it felt like it was likely to occur. And so they would erase, make it a very high, you know, rating. So one of the things you got to do is take a look at, am I doing emotional reasoning or am I looking at reality? And of course, the second thing is, so how bad it would be if you passed out at the grocery store? Oh my gosh, that would be the worst thing I can imagine in the world. So that would be the same as your kid getting killed or having your arm catch, you know, cut off or something like that. Well, no, 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 wait a minute. That would be worse. You know, so on a scale of one to 10, maybe it's only a one or a two, you know, because I'm not going to hurt myself. I'm just going to be embarrassed. Right. Uh, so people tend to over exaggerate how likely something's going to occur and how bad it's going to be the awfulness of it. So the two things that you got to take a look at. So based on reality, 
how likely is it to occur, and then how awful would it really be, and then you move into how could I prevent it, and what could I do if it were to happen. And those are the two steps that people that, that get really anxious about do a lot of what-if thinking don't do. And if you look at people who deal with, with uh, uh, situations well, they automatically move into those areas, right? They say, well, you know, not real likely this is going to happen. And, you know, if it does happen, it's not going to be the worst thing in the world. And here's what I can do to, you know, manage it. And here's what I can do to prevent it. You know, and you can you can apply that to most things in life. And again, there are some things that are truly catastrophic, like what if I take a flight on an airplane and the plane crashes? But again, the likelihood of that's pretty low, right? <laughs> I'm, I'm safer in the airplane than I am driving my car down to the grocery store. So... Yeah happen driving to the airport or getting getting the train yeah. <laughs> so yeah you know, you know so some some things yeah you know, and that gets back into kind of your philosophy of life and when we talk about that meaning aspect uh you know that, that there are some things like i cannot i cannot prevent uh and that would be terrible but you know most of the time they're not going to happen so most of my life is going to go okay you know the things that are going to come up in my life are going to be those minor uh, disturbances and irritations and those setbacks that while they're not good and I don't like them, they're manageable and I will move on. And that's the, that's the history of, of most people's lives. Yeah, no, but uh, yeah, with that, it, all you're saying to me is like, yeah, take responsibility for the things you can like control and like certain key aspects of your life. But, you know, like, yeah. And, and don't buy trouble, you know, and again, that emotional reasoning, I think for a lot of people that have a lot of stress, they do a lot of that. Oh, yeah, this is going to happen. It's going to be the worst thing in the world. Yeah. And just have a, like, have a healthy perspective of reality. Yeah. Uh, and just... I, I, I used to tell my clients, I'm just a rea- realist, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a, I'm, a, you know, and reality sometimes sucks, but you got to deal with it, right? <laughs> So, so be a realist. People spend a lot of time. Uh, you know, the, the other thing that people do a lot is, is something that uh, I, I call circular why questioning. You know, something happens and they sit there. I don't understand why this happened. How could that happen? I mean, this this doesn't make any sense. Why would this happen? Uh, so, for example, somebody treats me badly, right? I don't understand why the person would act like that way. I mean, why would... So I, I would always tell, ask the client, why do you think that happened? And they would give me a perfectly good explanation but it violated some should must rule about the way the world should be, you know? And so rather than recognizing I would like things to be this way, but they're not, they get caught into this. I don't understand how could this happen? And I, th- and I think that's the other thing is whenever you notice yourself doing that, like you need to recognize that there's the way you would like things to be, but they're different. And so now you decide what am I going to do about it? It's, it's, those should must rules that we have in life uh, sometimes really generate a lot of anxiety and stress. Yeah, and on that in that anxiety and stress, it's huh, and mm. it seems at in the moment where you're in the thick of it, like sometimes uncontrollable. But yeah. it's not as uncontrollable as we sometimes think it is. You know? <laughs> And there, there is a caveat I need, I need to put out there is that uh, the sick, hungry, tired. <laughs> a lot of times those things are just an indication that you're sick, hungry, tired. You know, when I, when I was doing parenting classes, uh, I, I talk about the great evils with kids. You know, the sick, hungry, tired, right? You, you don't take your kid shopping just before nap time, right? <laughs> otherwise, otherwise you're, you're in for a really ugly time. And so sometimes uh, what's going on w- w- with with me is just I'm sick, I'm retired, and I just need to maybe take care of that need and put everything on hold and then take a look at it again a little bit later on, you know, maybe tomorrow morning or something. And the world looks so different after I've done that. Because <laughs> when you're sick and retired, your brain doesn't work as well. You know, people have this 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 crazy idea that I can all that I'm, I can make myself function regardless of what happens. You know, I can, I can force myself to be okay. You know, and I think uh, our movies, you know, um, reinforce this idea. We see the guy; he's gotten beaten up, thrown out of the airplane, run over, stabbed, and yet he's still moving along. You know, still trucking. <laughs> In reality, that doesn't happen. You know, 
But oh. a lot of people actually believe I, I can make myself function at 100% regardless of what's going on in my life. And that's not true. Uh, I, there was it, I, um, there's a YouTube channel called Screen Junkies. And they uh -huh. basically did, like, they, they, they basically played out the scenario of how many times John McClane would have died from Die Hard. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it was like, I mean, it, like yeah, just like, um, yeah, concussion here, this, that, there, that. Blah, 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 blah. And like, by the time, like, by the time the film ended, yep. he would have died. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, 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 but we see so much of that, and we see people being able to just seem to be like Superman, you know, walking through all this stuff. And, and a lot of people actually think that I can make myself function at 100% regardless of how tired or whether I'm sick or whatever. And it's not true. You know, your brain is not going to function as well when the body has got stuff going on. Yeah. But like, this is the thing. It shows, like, how can I put it? In many respects in today's society, depending mm -hmm. where you what sort of in just like sector you're working in, like that, pushing yourself while you're sick and yeah. or tired to like redlining yourself all that way is seen as a sign of, yes, that's a go getter. Yes. That's, yep, the, yep. That's, that's the way leadership should like come down uh, to it. And this is how that person is going to succeed, which. Yeah, that's a crazy idea. No, <laughs> it's, that's what the, that's what they've been selling. That's the Kool-Aid uh, a number of us have been drinking. I, I yeah. know, I know. But you know, you know that that's the type of stuff as you recognize it and recognize that. In fact, it's amazing. Um, you, you see every now and then articles about how sleep deprived people are mm. because they spend too much time, you know, with, with you know the artificial lighting and television, staying up late and all that type of stuff. And that was another thing. A lot, a lot of my clients, I found that if I could just get them to sleep a little bit more, it made such a big difference in their life. And just taking care of the basic needs, you know. Yeah. Eating, a little, eating a little bit more healthier, sleeping a little bit more. That in itself sometimes can can make a big difference in a person's life. Yeah. No, I hear you. I hear you. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I mean, every, everything we're talking about is just kind of common sense, you know, recognizing who we are, right? <laughs> but this is the thing. Yes, you. It, what you're saying is common sense. What you're saying makes total sense. But, I will but, get but, but as as they say, common sense is not always common. Well, exactly. Uh, there was going to be someone to listen to this podcast and go, right, that's correct. And they are going to do the complete utter opposite yeah. of the podcast to what every, everything you're saying. Yeah. <laughs> well, and there will there'll be a few that'll, that'll, that won't. They'll, they'll say, well, wait a minute, maybe I need to sit down and take a look at what's going on, at least when some of the layer. You know, and, and one of the things that I found a long time ago, a concept that, that I liked, is that sometimes just a few little changes makes a big difference. It's not like you have to, you know, totally throw everything out and start over. Sometimes just a little difference here and there, making a, a little start, can make a big difference in your life. And yeah. get you on, in a new, traje new trajectory. Yeah, well, this is great. Like how do you build like how do you build a house with brick one brick mm -hmm. at a time? Yeah, and people often get that and they like do the sort of epic move, expecting everything to change in their life, where and they epically fail more times than not. Sometimes it pays off. Don't get me wrong. Well, that's it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, so, so, sometimes, you know. You know, and and again, the 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 interesting thing is people exist in such a variety of ways and what works for one person does not necessarily work for another person. And so, you know, finding those things, you know, taking a lot of the things we've been talking about and finding those elements that are going to help you make your life a little bit better, I think are, are, are part of the key. Yeah, no, I agree. Mm -hmm. I agree. Now I am curious, like sort of taking this on a slightly different tack, how many books have you written in your sort of like your time? Of oh, just, well, just, just four that are out there. So yeah. first two were anxiety and then one on anger and then the current one on emotions. So wow. how long did it take you to write your first book? Oh, the first book took a while. It, it was about a year. Uh, but then I, I write by committee. Um, 
that one was about uh, actually it flowed out of a, um, a mail order program for people with panic disorder and mm -hmm. so i decided to put it in a in a book format uh and so as i would write a chapter i would give it to a a bunch of clients for them to you know give me suggestions on and then i had another set of readers that were like frustrated english majors who weren't using their major they were great readers right yeah <laughs> And then, then I had some professionals I would look at. So, so it went, went through a couple of different uh, groups of people, which was great because, you know, when you don't, when you write something, everything you write makes sense to you. And then you look at it a week later and you realize this is garbage. <laughs> this does not say what I wanted it to say. Because again, you know, as you're writing things, it's just, you know, regardless of how you're saying it, it you know what you're trying to say. And so it makes sense to you. Mm -hmm. And so having it set for a couple of weeks and then having people then give you feedback on it, of course, some of it you look at and you realize, no, this is not good. Uh, and, and again, you use the old thing is if everybody's telling you this, this is not good, then you want to pay attention. If it's just one person and you really like that, then you keep it right. <laughs> so that's kind of the process. And even this last book, which was much quicker writing because you know, I've just done In fact, that first book is how I learned how to write. I had one lady that was a client. She had, she was obsessive compulsive and she was an editor for the state uh, printing and, uh, every page looked like it bled when she got done with it and we were, we were able to reduce about a third of the book throw it out just by condensing things down and make it more you know concise yeah and she, she wrote this wonderful note uh, after it was all over she says you know i really liked like the book I, I did have my pen in hand and i really didn't mean to make so many corrections but i did have my pen in hand <laughs> she she was the only client i ever had that proofed my intake form which is why I wanted her for a reader. <laughs> she was great. Oh, brilliant. Brilliant. Yeah, so, so so if you have any budding writers out there, be willing to take criticism. You got to get a real thick skin, you know, and just let people take a look at your stuff and, uh, you know, look at it objectively. And some of it you're going to agree with and some of it you won't. But uh, get a lot of feedback. And so that that's what, what I do when I write. Yeah, no, I can imagine. That, that, yeah. that first book. Ooh. <laughs> well, it, it was good. I, I had another lady on, on the second level, uh, uh, Allison. Yeah. And uh, one of the things that I did is I was I would use the phrase most important a lot. So it's important to remember and it's most important. And of course, it's important if you. And so she would write these little arrows on the page. And you say, so which one is really most important? <laughs> <laughs> no. it, it must. Oh, it's like a. Mm. But, well, but, well, you learn. You learn that you know this is this is something that I I need to, a habit I need to break, right? <laughs> so, Sophie's choice of writing. <laughs> well, you know, and 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 you, for me, I, I I had a little file of things that I do that I need to quit doing, and so after I'd write something, I'd kind of look at that. I'd refresh. Then I'm, did, did I use important too many times? Uh, and of course, I had to learn how to do a gender neutral. Because back then, gender neutral writing was coming into style. Uh, so, and and you know, growing up, everything was he and she, you know he and and the man and the person. You know, and so I had to change it into the person or people, and you know, using that type of language. So, <laughs> I mean, that's that's so current nowadays. People realize that we we went through a transition on that. Oh, man, mankind, people, you know, or humankind, those types of phrases. Yes. I, I, trust me. I, I've, I've been aware. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, over the course of time. And so, of course, over the over the last uh, 20 years, there's, we, we've gone through a couple of iterations of what's what's OK and what's not OK. Oh, like this, I would say with regards to like 20 years ago. Yeah. Like, OK. Like, whew. Self-censorship was not so, so much of a thing. Like, like, if you could say something outlandish or, like, yeah, yeah. say something damn right horrid, and, yeah, you'll be pretty much fine. No, like, or, like, it might pain you a little, but you can move on with your life. Yeah. Today, you can, like, you might say the wrong thing, uh, or you might be ignorant to something, well, and, and we've gone way too far the other direction. Ah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's, I, I, you know, you read the comedians, talk, comedians talk about how it's it's hard to be funny nowadays because, you know, 
comedy, good comedy has an element of truth in it. <laughs> well, that, that, that's the whole thing about comedy. Like, well, it's yeah. the thing about the theater and every, like any good story, there is like um, joy and tragedy. Like, you know, oh, yeah. and, and if you like each of them, when it like, are, when you're really dealing with the truth of something, the truth is not something which is pretty. The truth is not something which is nice all the time. There is some ugly things. Oh, yeah, yeah. Like when you start getting into it, and if you can't accept that, you'll never be able to see the truth, and you'll never be able to change things which might be bad. Yeah. It's something bad. And people are very hypersensitive, or, or not many, many people are very hypersensitive today, so... <laughs> yeah of course you know a lot, a lot of the, the guys i hang around with we, <laughs> we 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 like to really joke a lot i i know i have a small group that i've been meeting with for 20 years and uh, uh there's three guys of us and uh we like to joke a lot and something will come up and the, the three of us will start bouncing off of each other and it's funny because the wives are just sort of staring with this kind of deer in the headlight <laughs> expression while we're we're bouncing off of each other you know, it's like, yeah. <laughs> and then this was said and that was said you're like okay yes yeah, yeah. Um, but like this is the thing like if you like well if you can chew the fat with like good friends like that which you've had over the course of like a lifetime being able to like yeah laugh joke talk about a myriad of things some like some quite safe and some like a, like some things which common like most of society might say oh that's risky but it's not really that risky at all it's something which needs to be talked about yeah i think people are a lot healthier when they can do that i think much of some of like of society anxiety right now is the simple fact that if people say X, Y, and Z, that there'll be such a repercussion to them, yeah. their lives. It's like, ah, but it might be a real problem with them, which is causing them pain and which might be holding them back. Or who knows, could be leading them some real dark paths, but no yeah. one's no one's allowed to talk about it. No one's allowed to say things. Uh, like, like, you know what I mean? There are... Definitely... Well, see, see that, that's the advantage of getting older. Is you really don't care. <laughs> yeah. It's like... Yeah. Mm. You know, it's like, the, like the whole thing is... Yeah. Like, yeah, I would say... Being of a certain age or coming from a certain era, yes, you've seen life where it's been... Fair on some things, really unfair on other things. Oh, yeah. But, like, the whole thing is, like, where you were, like, say, where you were when you were a young man, like, going from his teens into his 20s, and you looked at society, went, there are a number of things which are wrong. Mm -hmm. But that discussion, through that conversation which was had uh, on a day to day, on, like, through, like, all of this discord, things changed for the better, which unfortunately mm. now I don't actually see much discord. I see screaming, I see shouting, and I mm. see like parties just sticking to their own little sort of like incel groups. I'm going to say incel groups, like I'm, I'm talking across the whole of it, like whole of society where they're not prepared to listen to each other. Which I think holds everyone back. It's it's yeah, I, I, I agree. That that's that's one of the things that, that I find is really sad about today is is it's hard to have an intelligent conversation on a lot of topics with some people because they just want to shout their opinion or their perspective and they don't want to listen and dialogue and really talk in a reasonable manner, you know. Um I mean my my whole life Again, that's that's been part of who I am and you know what I do with people, um, but but at the same time, you know, society goes through cycles, and I I think uh, we'll get through this, and 
it'll shift again down the road. I mean, we, you already see, at least as I see, a, a lot of indications that people are saying, you know, we've gone way too far on all of this, a lot of this stuff, and we need to start shifting back. Mm. Now, this is the thing. I would, I, would, I would love it to shift into a realm of common sense and reason. Like not to be like, yeah, it goes to one extreme, which you're like, okay. Then it goes to another extreme. Yeah. Like, okay. Look. Well, we'll enjoy it when you're in the middle. So. <laughs> yeah. well, you know, like, sometimes the middle is not the middle. If you go <laughs> yeah. But still, like, okay, I'm in the middle. <laughs> and the world has shifted. Like, it's yeah. like way over that way. Way over that way, and you just like go, yeah. what's going on? <laughs> yeah, it's uh, th there's you know a lot of stuff going on. I mean, I, I have hope for the long term, so uh, I, I think we're we're going to learn. I, I I see some upheavals coming up with some of the technology and stuff coming on the on the uh, road. I mean, there's going to be a lot of people displaced. What do we do with that, especially with AI and some of the automation automation that's coming out? Um. Uh, I see such a denigration of education and knowledge um, that's going to affect a lot of people as they get older, you know. Um, but, you know, it's all stuff down the road. I, I used to tell my kids in, in, in the class, uh, you know, at my age, you know, this is your problem. I'm out of here another 20 years. So. <laughs> <laughs> Like when you say that, do you see the look on like the like some people's faces? Like, go, what? <laughs> it's like, why? Yeah. why? Like, no, no, no. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, it's 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 interesting talking with my daughter and stuff. Uh, so just about where she's at. Uh, you know, I don't know where it's going to go. Again, it gets back to that that third thing on uh, meaning. You know, what life's all about. Is there you know is there a higher power? Is there not? Are we just little mechanical beings, you know, that when we're dead, we're gone? Uh, I, I know one of the things that, that, that I like to point people to is some of the near-death studies that have been going on over the last 20 years. Uh, when you really look at some of the, and there's, in, in, in the current book, I've got a reference to a, a study with a lot of people, and they came up with it that, we can't explain what's going on through standard science. There's something happening, and it certainly points to something beyond death. And if you take that leap, okay, how's that going to affect how I'm looking at my own life and uh, the things that happen to me now? Uh, I leave that up to individuals to figure out, uh, you know, whether you want to go a traditional religious route or you want to go some other route with it. But if there is something more than just what we see, how are you going to work that into how you look at stuff and how you're going to live your life? You know, like this is the thing. If you believe there is, like the universe is vast and expansive and goes on for like literally, can go on until infinity. There's infinite, like there's an infinite realm of where, oh yeah, there is no higher supreme being like, you know what I mean? Taking this on to the next level or taking this there. But also there is, because there are. Well, see, 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 that, I come in perspective, there is. I mean, one thing that, that physics is pretty clear about is there was a beginning and there will be an end of the universe. So, hmm. got to be something outside of it then. Well, hey. <laughs> 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 which, which, which really, which really, uh, it does a thing to your mind. You know, the, the think of somebody who's outside of time and space, right? You know, we, we, there's no way we can conceive of that. But again, uh, that that I leave up to the individual to decide where they're going to go with that. But I do think it's it's useful to take a look at the fact that uh, Moody in the 1970s kind of kicked off that whole area of research with, uh, you know, near-death experiences uh, with his book, Life After Life. And like I said, there's been a lot done with it since then. Uh, and anybody who looks at it comes to the way with, yeah, there's, there's more than just this physical realm. I like to believe so, too, because, like, the whole thing is, like, well, it's just, I... Like, I believe there is, like, we live in, in a universe full of, like, 
full of possibilities. And mm. like, if you look at, and if people go, yeah, there are universes upon universes upon universes upon universes. Okay, every galaxy leads to another universe. There mm. are 200 million, like 200 billion galaxies out there. So oh, that is... Well, there is. I mean, we, that's a whole other discussion we get into because when you start playing those statistics games, they really fall apart. <laughs> Well, uh, I mean, there, there's no, 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 no physics uh, evidence for multi-universe. Uh, but, when you when you look at most of the galaxies, most of them would not support organic life as we know it. Mm-hmm. Uh, you, it's 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 interesting the structure of the universe because uh, you have to have a spiral galaxy in order to support life, and you have to be way out on the edge of it, like our planet is. Otherwise, there's too much radiation that we just totally destroy any kind of organic life. Uh, and most of the, the galaxies are not spiral galaxies. You have to have a sun that's exactly the right age. Our solar system is really unique because evidently there were two supernovas fairly close in our, uh, when, our when it started that seeded it with all the heavy metals because most galaxies and most solar systems do not have all of the, you know, the, the uranium, the carbon, the uh, iron, the things that you need for a uh, civilized society and higher life forms. Uh, it's uh, there's, there's just a lot of interesting things when you really get into it. When you even look at this whole uh, the, the soup idea, the, the uh, organic soup that life started from, in the year in 2000, there's the uh, evolutionary uh, research group that got together, and they basically threw up their hands because all of those old theories from the last century have fallen apart. We have no explanation for how life started, uh, and I mean, even you take a look at something like the the amino acids. Amino acids have uh, like a left hand and a right hand form, mm-hmm. and all of life on Earth, all of the amino acids are left handed, and all the sugars are right handed. And there's no way to explain how that could occur in a natural environment, because uh, anything that would have formed, you'd have a combination of those two forms, and then anything that that developed would fall apart fairly quickly. So it's, yeah, you, you look into the, the design of the universe, there's a mind out there that, that had a role in it. Now, how, again, I've got my ideas of how I think about it, but I'm not going to put that on other people. I will let them kind of come up with it. But uh, most people don't understand how intricate this universe is. And most scientists who really understand it, they're in awe of the fact that there is a hand behind there somehow. What that is and how it works, again, a lot of different ideas on it. But yeah, this this is an amazing universe we live in. You can tell I'm a science geek, right? <laughs> I'm, I'm not even going to pretend that uh, as I go. Yes, I, of course, Bob. No, I'm not. <laughs> like, I, yeah. I always am. Like, I always love talking to people, and I always like to listen. And like, yeah. you know, with like talking to talking to like a myriad of people over the course of time. It's helped me learn and grow, especially yeah. like with regards to doing the podcast. Because as as you know, as time goes by, you get to talk to less and less people as each decade goes by. And you act like most of the conversations you have are very sort of superficial, and you're, where you're not really learning anything. This podcast, thankfully, has given me the means to engage with people I would never speak to. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Or the odds of us ever like talking, like by chance, if you were in Birmingham, or like if by chance, if I was in California and we turned and like, yeah, struck up a conversation, that is uh, the lot, the odds on that are like very, very high of like that not actually happening at all, yeah. you know? Yeah, and we've, we've certainly covered a lot of different topics. Right. <laughs> Ah, this is the thing. I uh, like, yeah, like this. Like, I always had mm. like have a good conversation, and yeah, a good conversation doesn't normally just doesn't always stay in one ballpark. Yeah, 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 yeah. But yeah, I have to ask, like, where would you like your journey, your current life journey, to take you over the next? Well, I'm I'm pretty pleased with where it's at right now. Uh, you know. Part of who I am is that I'm a service individual, and so most of my life uh, I've 
in one way or another, I've, I've been in service to other people and trying to make people's lives a little bit better in some some way, even if it's just a small way. And I'd just be really pleased. In fact, I, I'm, I'm just delighted every now and then when I get a message from somebody that says that something that I've done has helped them be more successful in life. I mean, that to me is a real joy. Uh, and once and every now and then I'll get a call or an email or something from somebody that I worked with, you know, years ago, just saying how their life changed from that point. And if this book that I wrote currently helps people, you know, understand who they are and how to manage their emotions a little more effectively, that would just be a joy to me. Yeah. Oh, no. You know what? <laughs> hmm. That's a nice place to end it. Ah, now I have to, I have to ask, where would people be able to find you, get more information, get that extra nuggets of knowledge? Well, the easiest place is my website, and it's easy to remember. It's why w h y emotions dot com. So why emotions dot com, and you get links to. I've got a YouTube channel where I've got a bunch of, you know, things on assertiveness and what not all anxiety disorders. And, you know, it has links to that, has links to uh, the books, uh, some freebie stuff up on the website. So whyemotions.com is where you get all that stuff. Brilliant. Brilliant. Uh, so I'd like to say thank you for coming on to the podcast today. It has been a delight, a pleasure to speak to you. Well, it's it's this has been a real fun podcast. So I, I thank you for inviting me and just uh, being such a great host. So, uh, you see, mm. I, I have not paid him to say this, people. Yeah. <laughs> well, so you got to buy. You, everybody's got to buy a lot of books to make up for that, right? So, <laughs> yeah, yeah, he's like, yeah, like, yes. yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Love it. And I've got to say thank you to you, my friends, my life warriors, for sticking with us to the end of the show. Yes. Uh, yes, indeed. Please stay safe, stay well, be awesome, be excellent, be fantastic. Be all the positive things you can be in this world and then some. And remember, capture that horizon. Hurrah. Yeah. Peace. Yeah. And we are.